us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, O oh, bind us together in love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together in love. Made for the glory of God. Purchased by His precious Son. Born with the right to be clean. For Jesus the victory has won. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, bind us together in love. You are the family of God, you are the promise divine. You are God's chosen desire, you are the glorious new wine. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, bind us together in love. That I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that he let thee. I am the Lord that he let thee. I am the Lord that he let thee. In thee, O Lord, I put my trust in Thee, O Lord. I put my trust in Thee, O Lord. I put my trust. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for calling us to be your children. We thank you for allowing us to be parents and grandparents, to be aunts and uncles, to be people of relationship, to be people of family life. We pray that as you call us, that we'll respond to that call. We ask you, O oh Lord, to strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that we will always be able to hear your voice. And Lord, when we hear it, and it may be unfamiliar to us, we pray that someone in our life will be able to direct us to know who you are so that we may fall in love with you more and more. We ask you, O oh Lord, to make your holy word take root in our hearts and in our minds, that we may speak and do those things that are worthy of the kingdom of heaven. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our hymn for, the, for this evening. Him 521. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Him 521. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. 
Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Purer than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold all my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. You may be seated. Our reading passage for this evening comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. Anybody remembers what we did last week? You sure? What was last week about? Children are a gift from God. What's that? Mark 10 to 14b? No, no, no. That's the, that's the, that's the theme. But well, last week we used... We used Genesis last week. I, I'm not crazy. I know I, we did Genesis last week, right? Yes. And I, and I went on. Yes, I said that children are a gift but that we have no little ones to call if they don't come from families, all right? And I use um, Abraham and Sarah as the example of having their son Isaac and, and so on to teach about what it means to be family, right? And I told you today we're going to look at the call and, and the sacrifice uh, of a call and when does God call? So... 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 9. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel, well, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. 
the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The word of the Lord. Now, there's some important things here that I hope that you're already gathering. We know that Samuel was given back to God by his mother Hannah. Remember that, right? And she said that he would be a Nazarene and he would live there. So Samuel is the adopted son of Eli. He's not living with his parents. He's living in the temple with the priest, Eli. And he was ministering to the Lord under Eli. So what does that tell you? He was an apprentice. You see, prophets were apprentices of other prophets. It wasn't just that the Holy Spirit came and made somebody a prophet. There were schools of prophecy. And they had to learn what it meant to be a prophet. So Eli is under the tutelage of Eli. Samuel, was that? Of Eli. I, what, what I said? Eli was his... Sorry. I'm tired. It's a long day. <laughs> he was ministering and yet he did not know what he was doing. And why this is important is because when we bring children to church, it is okay that they do not know what they are doing. It is okay that they do not know what they are doing. Many of you must ask yourself, how many, how many of the things that you do in church, you know exactly what you're doing? You know exactly what you're doing when you come to church? You sure? How many times are you supposed to make the sign of the cross in church? Since you know what you're doing. I saw you shaking your head, Anna. How many? Plenty time. Pl plenty time. Well, you can't get it wrong, but it's it not really right, right? <laughs> you know how many? What? Every time you say Jesus? No. It is 72 times, right? You're supposed to make the sign of the cross 72 times. Right? Well, nobody never taught us that. And, and you, you see, and I want you to understand that when you start to tell children about things that you don't understand, how do things get muddy? How the thing gets money. Because what you are doing in teaching is teaching what you have seen many times other people doing without asking, why do we do that? So the boy, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord under Eli. What was he doing? Did he know what he was doing? No, because we read here that he did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet come to him. So he didn't know the Lord. So he's doing all these religious things. Yeah? He's lighting the lamp. He's going, he's saying his prayers. He's going to temple and, and offering sacrifices five times a day. And yet all of it is empty because he doesn't know really and truly what he's doing. He is just following what Eli is telling him to do. And that's the first step of introducing people to any form of religion. We learn by imitation. You understand? So when it comes to imitating what we see in church, that's the first step. That's the infancy of being in church. Let the children come to me and do not stop them. 
they're not supposed to have a bachelor's degree in, in churchology. <laughs> right? You, you see why, why this is important? Because when we come to receive Holy Communion, for instance, which people have a problem with children coming and to receive and all kind of thing, right? When you as adults come to receive Holy Communion, are you fully aware of what you're receiving? Are you fully aware? None of us are. We could never be fully aware. To be fully aware is to be like God. God is fully aware of every single thing. Not so? Are you fully aware now? All right, we change the answer to no, right? See how, see how we fudge a bit, right? Shade the different answer. We cannot know God in God's totality. When we come to church, what are we receiving in the sacrament? It's a real lesson today. Eh? Why don't we say the body and blood of Jesus? Why don't we say the body and blood of God? You see all the people who said, tell me how they know everything already, right? Eh? Are looking for all the answers. <laughs> because we just said that we know. And if we know, we ought to teach what we know. We know that we have to put our hands so. We know that when we receive, we have to say, Amen. But do we know why we say the body and blood of Christ and not the body and blood of Jesus? So the boy Jesus, uh, Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And we can't pass that yet, right? You want me to tell you why? Because the theology is there are two natures in Jesus. There is God the Son. Fully God, fully man, not so? So God the Son is in the person that is named Jesus. So there are two divine natures in this Jesus which we call the one Christ. You understand? <laughs> there are two natures. In Jesus, the divine nature, that is the Son of God, and then you have the soul, which is Jesus, in the human person. That's the incarnation. It's known as something called a hypostatic union. I didn't want to go into all of that, right? Where the two are so intermingled, so connected, that they could never be divided. And so the church says, we don't have two Jesus, or two, but one Christ. So when we receive the body and blood of Christ, Christ means the anointed one. So rather than people coming to say, well, you're eating the body and, and drinking the blood of a man, which is Jesus, if we say Jesus alone, in that way, right? That could be wrong. Theologically, it would be wrong to say that. Theologically, it would be wrong to say that we are eating and drinking the blood of the Father or the Holy Spirit. For only one part of the Godhead became man. That is Jesus the Christ. So in the Saint Athanasius Creed, you would hear all of that being explained. You understand? And this is just a small example of when we say that we know something for me to show how much we don't know. Yeah? We don't know. Right? So for all these years we're coming up and you're hearing the body and blood of Christ and, and nobody has ever asked, but where's Jesus? You understand? So, we go down. When Jesus, when God calls, he calls with a familiar voice. God does not call anyone 
with an unrecognizable voice. Any person that has ever said they, they got a calling from God, did you ever feel it was a stranger calling you? No. Sometimes the voice sounds like your own. Not so? And we say our mind tells us not to do so and so. No, that's, that's not true. Your mind always tells you to go in the opposite direction. And if, you, if your mind really told you to do, do something, wouldn't you listen to yourself? Or do, do you doubt yourself so much that you can't listen to your own self? And if you can't listen to your own self, who should listen to you then? So God calls Samuel with the voice that he has always known. The voice of Eli. So when God called him, he runs to Eli. He must know if it's not Eli. The voice would have been different. No, but it sounds like you. Here I am. And he presents himself because he is a student. He is obedient to his master's call. So immediately when he hears it, he goes to his master. And his master says, no, I, I didn't call you. Go and, go and lie down. Go and lie down. It's not me. Right? He goes and he lies down and the voice calls again. Samuel. He gets up and he, and he goes. Right? And then Eli says to him, no, my child. You see the fatherhood of of ministry already all the other people like to say don't call nobody father and, and don't understand what Jesus was talking about this is the very reason why Jesus was sp speaking about it that the scribes and Pharisees wanted the people to call them father but they were not leading anybody they were not spiritual fathers to anybody rather they condemned people right so Eli tells him, no, my child, go on, go on, lay down. And then the third time he calls, and then Eli perceives, gathers, the Lord is calling who? The child. And we have to pause there again. Do we take time with our children to see and to listen to what the Lord is calling them to. There are many parents in the world today who have plans for their children from the time they come out of the womb. You will have to grow up to be so and so. Yes? You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, that in and of itself is not bad to have some kind of idea of you want somebody to achieve something and you want them to, to grow up and, and so on. But what is the Lord calling that child to? There are many vocations that go dead. And I mean vocations to, to ministerial life vocations to the priesthood that go dead because of parents not listening to the voice of God but listening to their own self. God doesn't call people in their old age and I don't make any excuse for that. Right? When he called Abraham, he called Abraham because it's the children he wants to know. Remember Sunday was this weekend when I talk about Abraham was good as dead. Yeah? You feel God don't know that? But God wanted a good family so that Isaac could come up. It's the same thing with us. In the sunset of our lives, God is calling us to be supervisors. You understand what I'm, I mean by that? mentors guides like eli god can't call nobody to hard work you know what it is to call somebody who is 75 in today's world and say listen no i want you to leave everything that you work so hard for and set up shop somewhere else and do so for what 
For what? But we must be able to recognize when someone has a call on their life. We must be able to do that. Because the call still comes from within what? The family. This is why I'm emphasizing that Eli became his father. There's no word for stepfather or adopted father in, in, in the Hebrew language. You're either the father or the mother or you're nothing. You know that? That's why there's no real word for aunt and uncle in, in, in their language either. As long as you are in the family, the responsibility of raising the children is a collective one. So that my mother and father are my aunts and my uncles as well. They have that responsibility to raise me as much as my mother, my biological mother and father has that ability to raise me. So how do we say that Joseph was Jesus' father? Is because there, he cannot be a adopted father or stepfather. He is his father. You take responsibility, that is your child. You understand that now? So Eli has responsibility for him. The difficulty for, for us is to recognize that when God calls, God doesn't call people who know everything. He called Samuel, and Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Imagine that. See, we want children to go to Sunday school, and you hear them singing all those nice little Sunday school songs, right? I love you, Jesus, deep down in my heart. I love you, Jesus, deep down in my heart. Talk about deep, deep, down, down. Now... We like to see the little antics, the little actions and stuff too, right? But yet many of them, they don't understand that. They, they, they are wrapped up in, in the little dance moves too. That is what is attractive to them, right? Because they have yet to know who the Lord is. If anyone were to ask you, when did you come to know the Lord, what would you say? There are people who come for confirmation, they go through the whole rite. Do they know the Lord? No. Many of them don't. And the reason for it is simple, you know. And this is why we had to remember the first um, session. The reason for it is because there's no one to guide them. So there's no church at home. So there's no church at church. There's no church at Sunday school. All this is just another something. You follow? Look at where Samuel is. And he ain't know the Lord yet. Look at where he is. So think about people who only come to church once a month, once a quarter, once a year. I come into church only for funerals a wedding, maybe a baptism. How do they know the Lord? Samuel is there every day. How do you know the Lord? You see, we like to tell people, I know the Lord, you know. I have a relationship with God. And I know this and I know that, right? And I don't need the church. Well, that's the biggest one when I, when I hear people say that. Right? I don't need the church. If you don't need the church, why did Jesus, why did Jesus leave the church? You say you follow Jesus. Jesus leaves the church. And you say you don't need the church, but you and Jesus good. I don't know how that working. Right? Because the church is the dispenser of God's grace. Yeah? 
the church is the home of what? The spiritual family of God, where all the small church families, remember I, I said that all, all the families are little churches? That those little churches come to the big church to be nourished, to be encouraged, to receive from God what you cannot receive in your small church. Your home church. Let me stop saying small church. Next thing, everybody leave and go on Pentecostal after this. Right? <laughs> but in that home church. So if we don't do that, then we take everything else for granted. Right? And everything that we will do remains empty. So you come to church and you pray. It's another empty thing, right? The intercession. I'm sure everybody watching me, right? Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. You see how you rattle it off? You see how you rattle it off? And that's just an example of how empty that is. That we don't turn to say, here I am, Lord. Right? Isn't that what Eli told Samuel? Yeah? Your servant is listening. Here I am. Your servant is listening. When we come to, to church, we might listen, but I'm not sure if we hear. Right? There must be intentional listening when we come to church. Because when we pray, we are not just praying with our, our lips. We are praying with our whole being. It has to be intentional. Not so? So if these little ones are supposed to, to come to know the Lord and we are not to hinder them, Aren't they supposed to understand intercession too? So when they go to Sunday school, it is not the Sunday school teachers to tell them, close your eyes and clasp your hands and repeat after me. It is supposed to be that you say to the children, say any prayer that you want. Yeah? And let them pray. Let them pray for... For their friends in school, their parents, their goldfish, the dog, the, the cat. You understand? Let them, let them pray for a new school bag. Let them pray for, for sneakers. And because that is the world that they are in. You understand? You can't come and tell them, no, don't pray like that. Don't, don't say those things. No, tell God, thank you for the sunrise. And thank you for, for, for the rain and the dew. What little... What sunrise you're talking about? Huh? You mean pray for sunshine snacks? And that will be okay. And that will be okay because that's their world. We have to move them from that childish world into the mature world as living Christians, right? But we have to start somewhere. And we're not starting by telling them, no, you don't know how to pray. Because when we start a hammer, you don't know how to pray, you don't know how to pray, you don't know how to pray. And then you come and you sit in church. What have you been taught all these years? You don't know how to pray. So who knows how to pray? Well, apparently it's the priest. We went and we got it beaten out of us. You know how to pray. You know how to pray. You know how to pray. Right? We have created a generation, or generations perhaps, of timid Christians. Where does it start? It starts, it starts when they were called by God. They are the ones being called by God and we are telling them, don't pray like that. And then we are not showing them how to pray because we're using language that they don't understand. So the boy Samuel was yet to know God. 
all these years and he's still yet to know God he's taking you know taking his time so he learns all the outward rituals but then the Lord says you see now is the time for you to know me forget the rituals forget the rituals because when you're at home how many of you clasp your hands and close your eyes to pray one I don't do that sometimes I'm sitting on the chair I'm watching TV and I'm praying I can't tell you the last time I kneel long to pray because my knee has real hurt me I'm telling you the truth right if you all could kneel down and praise God, praise God but I cannot um, my knees can't take that and I have to tell the Lord I said Lord you know my knees can't take it you know just during this week when 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 I was very sick this week yeah yes I got a terrible bout of food poisoning really really bad and I'm on the bed and I was like Lord I don't know what else I did I'm sorry I also said Lord I know I, I told you I want to lose weight but I didn't know it was like this <laughs> I had a real conversation with God you understand because you know when you pray you don't pray with fine print you, you say Lord I want to lose weight and the Lord said well well here's here's something that will make you shed a few pounds and in quick time and then you say Lord not like this right not like this Lord how do we pray what is the example that is being set in the home around prayer yeah in our in our modern setting many families no longer eat together eaten in, in parts everybody's so busy that two persons might eat together the rest still doing homework or or they want to finish watch a movie and nobody makes it an insistent no we have to stop we have to pause so that when we sit together for meals we pray first we pray after you understand so the mode of prayer many times is no longer visible in the same way so imagine not having that as a visible constant in in the family and then coming to church and how do you feel you now feel embarrassed because you don't know what to do so you're hiding behind somebody else you're not too sure how to make the sign of the cross right and then somebody watch you and say are you you don't even know how to make the sign of the cross yeah because we speak down to people now remember we are infants or we are children of God at varying stages so let the children come on to me it's not just about an age number or an age theme eh? it is about us being children in God and still not knowing the Lord even though our physical age may be up here But how many of us actually know the Lord? We do all the things that are required. We read the Bible. We might say our prayers hurriedly, maybe. Yeah? Not taking our time to converse with God. It's not just about you us saying, Well, hello, God. Like if we pass in him on the street. Hello. Good afternoon, God, I and mean, we continue our way. But we make prayer out to be like that, just a passing thing. I want, I want to say my prayers fast so I could eat because I'm real hungry. I'm not hungry for Jesus, I'm hungry for the food. Why are you praying so long? How many Christians do you know the stoops when people pray in too long? Or they roll their eyes. Or they cough so that others will know listen you're going on too long what are you talking to God so long for 
All these are serious matters. Samuel is called and he doesn't know anything. We are called and we don't know anything. But do we respond? Now your response could be no, you know. But how many no's have we given to God? How many times has God called you in your life and you have said no? You don't have to answer and I just want you to think about it. And how many times that you have gone to God but you want God to say yes? Every single prayer we take to God, we want God to say yes. And God says, yes, okay. Now that I've said yes to your prayer, I, I want you to know. No. Wrong person. Right? And if God were to say to us, wrong person, then we'll say, but, but use God. And God will say, but you are my child. You are my child. And how I, I spoke to, to you all before. How many of you would tell your parents, your earthly parents when you were growing up, that you're not going to church? In other words, how many of you would say no and not doing so? Your mother or father asks you to do something at home and you tell them no and not doing it. What would happen? You'll be punished. You'll feel. You would know the Lord that day, right? <laughs> you would know the Lord that day. But watch how easy it is for us to say no to the Divine Father. Yeah? Watch how easy it is. That even when we finish our prayer, we could immediately say, whatever you asked him to do, the answer is no. We could say that immediately after we finish praying. We might say that is sacrilegious. I, I, I could never do that. And, and, and Father, something wrong. No, I could never tell God no. What kind of liars are we here this evening? Huh? We don't even like to visit our Father. We call the church what? The house of God? Not so? And I love you, Jesus, deep down in my heart. I love you, Jesus, deep down in my heart. Just not as much as Maracas Beach. <laughs> yeah. Not so? We could, we could put anything in there and we say no to God. Because God says, come and see me. Come and spend time with me and we tell him, no, I'm not coming. I will come when I want. Not so? Where was the boy Samuel and he did not yet know God? He was in the temple. He was in the temple. Day and night. He lived in there, you know. The word of God came to him by a call. Not to go and say, thus says the Lord. Right? Not to do that. But God came to him as a child so that he might be strengthened to remain in where he is as a priest of God. Yeah? And through Jesus Christ, through our baptism, we have, all of us, not just me, eh? all of us have entered into the royal priesthood of God. You don't know that? Watch how people looking at me like if I, if I talk in craziness here. Eh? God has anointed all of us through the waters of baptism to be prophet, priest, and king unto God our Father. What kind of example of the priesthood are we setting for? There's a ministerial priesthood and then there's the priesthood of the entire family of God. Because if Jesus is our great high priest, 
as is recorded in the, in the book of Hebrews. Isn't that what it said there? That Jesus is our great high priest. But we are members of the body of Christ. Then we are part of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. That is the teaching. But you cannot tell people that if you don't know, if you don't believe, if you don't trust God. If you're not listening to the small voice to say to them, let us pray as a family and let us see what God may be calling you to in this life. I would like you to be this or the other, but what is God calling you to? When Hannah prayed for this child, because she was being ridiculed and mocked by the other wife who had more children, right? And she went and she prayed. That same priest, Eli, went and found her on the steps of the temple and said, Woman, why are you so drunk so early in the morning? And, and she had to tell that same priest, I am not drunk. I am crying out to the Lord. And Eli said, The Lord will hear and has heard your prayer. And what happened after that? The Lord made a way. The Lord made a way. And she did not forget what the Lord did for her. Because if the Lord could do it once, he could do it again, not so? So she took that one child, that one piece of child, that sometimes people like to come and say, Father, my one piece of child, that's not yours. Since last week, I, I'm, I'm, that is a gift from God. Yeah? It is God's gift. My one piece of child. And she took that one piece of child straight back after he was weaned and made an offering to God. Scriptures tell us that she had ch more children after that. Not that she abandoned this child, you know. But she understood how great God is. And the only gift that I can give God is the gift that he has given to me. That's the teaching there. Yeah? We present unto you, O Lord, of ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to be a reasonable and lively sacrifice. What can we offer to God? Only what God has given to us. There's nothing else that we can give to God. And she gave this child back into the hands of the priest so that this child would serve the Lord all his days. When we bring our children for baptism, what are we telling God? Right. And this is why I keep telling people, you're not fooling me, you know. It, that is between you and God. When God asks you, why did you offer me this and take it back? I hope that we can answer. The children that we give to God ought to remain with God. Because we ought to be with God. Our home is supposed to be a place where God abides. Not that we only know Satan in our house and then come in to try to know God in church. It cannot work. It will not work. Because when you leave from here, because you're only here maybe mentally for half an hour, the other hour, your, your mind somewhere else, Right? When you leave from here and you go back to where all the problem is, who are we listening to? Who are we listening to? But you see, if we live out this faith, 
if we truly live it out we would recognize that the power of baptism if we had eyes of faith to see we would see the divine love of God being poured out into those children and a call placed on their life to be a good Christian for the rest of their days that is a divine call placed on them from the waters of baptism. But do we see it? No. What we see is that it have a christening party after that are trying to make before. So I hope the service is going and done just now. But thanks be to God. There's a, a young man came after church on Sunday. He said, Father, what do I have to do to be baptized? And I said, like the Ethiopian eunuch, all you need to have is that desire and the baptism will happen. Right? Because he came to church and the message got to him. Right? Something must stir up in us to understand what we are doing. Everybody told me, yes, we, I know what we're doing. No, if we knew what we were doing... Man, this place would be ram out, as the young people say. I don't know if they still say that. Eh? But, <laughs> but it would be overflowing. Because we understand God's love in the small community and God's love, which is the same love, magnified in the large community. So none of us have to approach God knowing anything. None of us have to approach God with an idea of what we want. But just to say the words, here I am, your servant is listening. A prayer that I want you to, to teach to your children and grandchildren. That when you come to pray with them, and I hope that after today or even starting from today that you would say even if you can't do it every day say in our family we're going to establish fridays saturdays sunday as a day that we come together for family dinner lunch and prayer yeah and prayer or prayer and lunch prayer and dinner that we establish something so that they know that this is a house of prayer that we are devoted to following God that we know that yes life could sometimes get out of hand but we must find our balance and you would say let us pray for each other you know Let's pray for your brothers and your sisters who may be away. Pray for your aunts and uncles. Pray for those who in your, in your school or in your workplaces. Because many times what I tell family, especially when I'm counseling for marriage, and I will tell the, the husbands in particular, learn to pray in front of your children. Learn to do that because many men... Not that they don't pray, but they don't pray with their families. They pray for them, right? The wives know that they pray, but for some reason they can't pray. And that's probably our cultural makeup, maybe something with slavery or whatever it is that has damaged us. Damaged, yeah? That we find difficulty with men responding to God's love and saying that they could be in church and do other things. Yeah? That's a difficulty. The call requires sacrifice. Samuel is called into deeper ministry. He is no longer called just to do the ritual things. He is called into a deeper 
understanding and love of God. And that is what could happen when we learn to listen to one another and pray in a more appropriate um, way for the needs of others. Right? It's almost that time. <laughs> and that's why I chose that hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Because we have to be molded. We have to be shaped. We have to allow the master to do his work in us. He has to smoothen the rough edges. He has to say to us, I want to create in you this. Because God knows what his purpose for us being on the face of this earth. He knows what it is. God knows what it is. And whatever it is, we will glorify God in doing it. So yes, indeed, God is calling some people to be lawyers and doctors and nurses and, and janitors and teachers and, and all, the, all the occupations that have in the, in the world except bandits and prostitutes, right? God is calling people to those things. God is calling the plumber and the mason. Sometimes we look down on those vocations and we ought not to. And we have children, many people in this world today, unhappy because they're living out mommy and daddy's dream and not what God had called them to. Right? Now, I'm happy that my parents never told me I couldn't be a priest. I remember at the age of five, my mother asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a priest. It was always something about just being in, in church that made me feel whole. You, you, you understand? Whole, not, not just happy. Whole. To feel complete. You understand? When I got married, I was still a Roman Catholic. You know who told me that you're not looking happy? It was Carleen, my wife. Right? And she said, you know what? You were supposed to be a priest, you know. I said, yes, I know. Right? I said, but I've made another decision, and I am your husband. And God worked it out because God knew he had created Ashton to be a priest and after going all through the thing and I and I met Bishop Bess and I told him that I want to be a priest in the Anglican Church and he said who am I to argue with God and I knew that God was speaking to me through him because what kind of madness it is that you don't know me from, from nowhere. I just went to church that day. He happened to be there. And I said, Lord, this must be your hand telling me that I'm doing the right thing. And when I spoke to him, he didn't say where you came from. Who are you really? You're sure. It, it, it didn't have any of those things. His immediate words were, who am I to argue with God? God has a purpose for all of us. And I tell people up until today, I'm extremely happy being a priest. <laughs> right? There's, no, there's nothing that I would trade this for. I love it. I love God and I love God's people. Or else I wouldn't be here. There are many excuses you can make in life to get out of things. But I want us to recognize here. God didn't call me because I was the best at anything or was smart or was good at anything. 
God called me because I was open to saying yes. And everything else he caused to happen. Right? When I look back in my life, and I think it was a few weeks ago, I told everybody that if it, it, it had 35 training class, and I, I used to come out to the second, and I was proud that I was coming out to the second in test. <laughs> I used to go home and tell my, my mother and father, at least I didn't come out last. <laughs> and I look at where I am today, and without God, none of it would happen. Stop putting God on the back burner. Stop putting God on the side burner that you don't like to use. Everybody have a favorite burner. Stop putting God on that one. Put him on your favorite burner. Right? Let him add the flavor to your pot. Let him be like the Maggie seasoning and the golden ray for your life. Yeah? So that whatever you do, it will come out tasting good. And if you don't know how to cook, add a little coconut milk to it, and it will come out tasting all right. That's how you know when people can't cook, eh? <laughs> so I want us to, to bear in mind what, what today is about. It's building from last week into this week. That is through the family we are called. Next week, we will be looking more fully into the life of of being sacrificed. Yeah? And I want us to give God thanks this evening for calling us through our parents to be children of God. Thank God that you were baptized and you were given a new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank God for the opportunity to come and receive his body and his blood that nourishes us for the road that is ahead. Thank God for the church family that we belong to. We may not always agree, but we give God thanks that we are still brothers and sisters and that the gift of reconciliation exists in the life of the church. Let us thank God for this evening. Let's thank God for the little coffee we had during the course of the day, the sandwich. Let's thank God if we fasted today. Let's give God the opportunity to be made manifest in our life and in the life uh, and through the things that we do. So when you set your hand to work tomorrow, say, God, may these hands glorify you. May my lips sing praises to you. And may my feet be led into the places that you wish for me to go. Bless our children. Bless and do not curse us, O Lord. And teach us to do the same in this life, today and forevermore. Amen. So as we did last week, we will do this week and sing with renewed vigor because we understand what it means to have thine own way. So we sing that hymn to close, Have Thine Own Way, hymn 521, 521. Have a sip of water first. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Purer than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded 
and weary. Help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold all my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, Till all shall see, Christ only always living in me. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this night and always. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Do enjoy the rest of this evening, everyone, and hope to see many of you during the course of the, the weekend.